My heartfelt thanks to the government of Nepal for hosting this CBA 8 workshop here in Kathmandu and across the country. Deputy Prime Minister, thank you very much. <coughs> it's been great to collaborate together. Looking at the clips that we saw earlier this, this morning from the field visits, I wish I'd been there, even during the traffic jam, to see the diverse ways in which people here have been adapting to the challenges of climate change. Let me also say thank you to our partners who have jointly organized this meeting, Clean Energy Nepal, BCAS, and my wonderful colleagues at IID, led by Salim Hook, who inspires us all and who has inspired many volunteers to work for nothing over the last few days and weeks. You can see how broad the constituency now is that understands community-based adaptation. If you look around the hall, we've had more than 400 people here from more than 60 countries. And if you look at the banners <coughs> of the co-sponsors to CBA 8, can I say thank you very much to all of you. We deeply appreciate your support. And we look forward to seeing your name on the banners at CBA 9, CBA 10, CBA 11, and so on as we go forward. My own understanding of adaptation and resilience draws very much from following over the last 35 years the process of change in a small village in Mali, West Africa. Over that period, half a generation or more. They've been dealing with drought, managing scarce water, growing different crops, and diversifying livelihoods. And this has given me a fundamental respect for knowledge, innovation, and capacity that you find at field level in village communities across the world. It's also taught me that national and local governments can make a big difference to that local capacity when they recognize and support that local knowledge and find the best means to continue to have that innovation capacity based at that local level. I'd also second the suggestion that we heard from our colleague from Burkina Faso, Mamadou Hanadia, that we draw further from the experience of that French-speaking Sahelian region, and maybe we can do that in CBA 9. We're really fortunate to have here a tremendous global leader, Cristiana Figueres. Thank you very much for coming, Cristiana. I know you're hugely busy, but it means a lot to have you here. As a leader, as a woman, you inspire me, and I know that you inspire us all to do more, to do our best, and to push ourselves harder at this time of huge challenge. Some of us had the pleasure of listening to you at lunchtime yesterday. You told us yesterday that 2014 was a truly key year if we are to get a strong, workable, global agreement in 2015 in Paris. Well, 2014 started well in Britain and Europe because we had very, very heavy rain and big floods. Many English people had their first experience of dealing with what happens when weather goes from average to extraordinary. And it brought big disruption to transport, to housing, to energy, the whole variety of aspects of life. Their worlds were turned upside down. And in the UK, 
We learned the importance of community and solidarity. We saw the limits of government support. And we learned about the importance of ecosystem adaptation and management to reduce vulnerability. I hope this experience, this direct personal experience, stays in people's minds as our governments get stuck into the negotiation process for the 2015 climate agreement. There's been increasing emphasis, and I know that uh, there's been discussion of that over the last two, three days, increasing emphasis on the vital role of the private sector in providing resources and in finding solutions to many of the problems we face. And I am all for being open-minded about new ways of doing things. But in the case of the UK floods earlier this year, the private sector did not magically appear with either the resources or the solutions. It was the publicly funded emergency services and community solidarity that did the job. And it was the public tax revenue that helped rebuild the damage. Insurance companies, for example, now only agree to provide high flood risk areas with cover because of a government-imposed levy on all insurance companies, on all insurance contracts. So I think we need honesty, balance, and realism about the role of the private sector in addressing adaptation to climate change. Let's not forget the rights and responsibility of government, local and national, to support and frame the adaptation challenge. At IRD, we've been testing out and learning from local systems for planning and financing the building of resilience to climate change. And what we've learned, whether from urban or from rural areas, is that it's not just the amount of money available, but 50% of the adaptation of, of the Green Climate Fund to adaptation would be great. It's not just the amount, but also how the funds are managed and delivered. It's about reversing power and decision making and recognizing local people have huge untapped knowledge, skills, and innovation capacity. We urgently need to reverse the concentration of money, power, and knowledge in our world today. We need that global power shift. We need to show that CBA is possible, it can work. I take great heart from the CBA constituency, part of which is represented here. It's big, it could be bigger. It's noisy, and it could be noisier. And it has knowledge. It needs to use that knowledge and power in this vital year of 2014. The Kathmandu Declaration is a great tool. Let's use it. Let's also listen to Christiana very carefully. We don't have time to wait. Let's think hard about how we can all contribute through our words and our action so that 2014 can indeed fulfill its promise as the vital year that leads us to a fairer, more sustainable world. I look forward to seeing all of you in Kenya next year. Thank you very much.